on this episode of Pawn Stars. I got a titanium nose piece off of the SR-71 Blackbird, signed by a pilot. Nice. If you were to take a 9 millimeter and fire it out of a handgun, the SR-71 was faster. That's true. What in the hell is this? Stand up and ride. He's standing up doing 50. It's pretty cool. You guys want to ride this? Um, no, I haven't updated my life insurance policies <laughs> here lately. <laughs> I brought in a solid bronze cannon. I'm pretty sure this was from a ship. It's got a date on it, 1517. Sounds pretty old to me. I do have a lot of concerns with it, though. Like what? If this was on a ship, there'd be somewhere. Uh, that's the first I've heard of that. I'm Rick Harrison, and this is my pawn shop. I work here with my old man and my son, Big Hoss. Everything in here has a story and a price. One thing I've learned after 21 years, you never know what is going to come through that door. What do we got? Got a very cool piece of aviation history for you here. A titanium nose piece off of the SR-71 Blackbird. OK. Where did you get this? Actually, uh, my dad came across it. He used to work on it back when it was a big national secret. You know, these planes were so mysterious at some point that they were actually like thought of as being UFOs. I came today to the pawn shop to sell a panel off of the SR-71, also known as the Blackbird. It used to be top secret reconnaissance plane for the United States Air Force. I'd like to sell it because I could use a little extra cash at the moment. So where did this go on the plane? Right up in the nose, right in this area. There was only three ever found that I know of, and we've got one of them right here. Signed right. by a pilot, in fact. Nice. I did a Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. in like 53 minutes or yeah, something like that? Yeah, in fact, it shattered the old record by like three hours and still uh, hasn't been touched. When Lockheed designed the SR-71 to spy on the Soviet Union, they realized they needed titanium to build it. But the only country with titanium was the Soviet Union. So the CIA created a bunch of shell companies to buy that titanium so they could build these birds. Pretty sneaky. That's the CIA for you. So you said it's made out of titanium, huh? That it is. It flew so high that the skin apparently reached like 600 degrees while it was flying, and anything else would have melted. Good. Working here most of my life, I mean, people coming in with titanium jewelry, I actually thought I could size a titanium ring one time and ended up breaking all the jeweler's tools trying to do it. It is not a fun metal to work with. Strong as all hell, though. We get a lot of military and aviation collectors in the shop looking for rare stuff like this. If this thing's legit, it could be a big score. You got a big hunk of titanium here, and you've got a hell of a story. True. Um, I'm inclined to believe you just because I've worked with titanium and I know what a bitch it is to work with. You could make a lot more money than making pieces of an SR-71 Blackbird. What are you looking to get on it? Another one went up at auction without the signatures and brought in 1500 it could bring in $2,500, $3,500 at auction, I'm pretty sure. You told me one sold for $1,500. I'm going to believe that's what this one sells for. I'll offer you $1,200. I'd like to hold steady at 15 I sell it to you for less than that. You guys will make a killing, and I'll lose out. All right, $1,500, man. Good deal. Follow me. Let's go do some paperwork. I was real confident we were going to make a deal. It's one of a kind. I'm going to take my $1,500 and go pay some bills and have some fun. I know you. You're the guy who sold me the Lamatt revolver, right? Yeah, I was in here before. Last time this guy came in, he brought in one of the rarest Civil War pistols there is, and I bought it for 10 Gs. So I can't wait to see what he's trying to unload this time. I brought in a solid bronze cannon. I know that it's old and apparently European. It's just time to move it on and buy something else. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I came down to the pawn shop today with an old cannon barrel. It's an item in my collection I've had a little while, and it's just time to move it on. I was hoping to get 2,500 to 3,000. Where did you get this? I picked this up at an auction. You know when it was made? Don't know anything about that. OK. It's got a date on it right here. And I don't know Roman numerals, so <laughs> okay. you're going to have to tell me. Um, 1517. Sounds pretty old to me. Um, yeah, uh, there's cannons as early as like 900 AD in China. 
Since the Chinese invented gunpowder, they definitely had a head start on the rest of the world when it came to producing cannons. The first European cannons came out right around 200 years after the Chinese first had them. This is a very small cannon. It's definitely portable. I'm pretty sure this was from a ship. Mm -hmm. So you could swivel it up and down, swivel it side to side. Basically load it, point it, fire it. I do have a lot of concerns with it, though. OK, like what? This date's suspicious. You don't see dates on cannons like this. Mm -hmm. And these trunnions, there is zero wear on them. So if this was on a ship, there would be some wear. Let me get someone to look at it, those a little bit more than I do. All right, we'll do it. I'm smart enough to realize that I don't know everything about everything. Some of the points he made made sense to me, so we'll see what his expert says. Hey, Rick. What? Somebody screwing with me and put a couple zeros on this, or somebody did pay 1500 for this damn piece of metal. I paid every bit of that. Sometimes I actually can't believe that Corey's the same blood as me. That boy's dumb as a box of rocks. So what is it? It's a panel off an SR-71 Blackbird. How do you know it's real? It's made of titanium. Who would make something fake like that? So what, are you a metallurgist now? How many times in this pawn shop have we dealt with titanium jewelry and crap? I don't think it's titanium. I don't know what the hell's wrong with these guys. Recently, I bought an old NFL program that turned out to be worth three times what I paid for it, and I still get no respect. I can't wait to rub it in everyone's faces when I'm right. Call Matt, get him down here, and bow down to the sun and pray that this thing is real when we get our money back. Yeah, let's see how badly you got taken. Hey, how can I help you? I got a pair of Levi's that I'd like you to take a peek at. They're a little on the small size. Chumley, I think I found a pair of jeans for you. <laughs> I came down to the pawn shop today to try to sell my vintage Levi jeans. I like to sell the jeans because they're just taking up space. I'm hoping to get $200. These are some huge, huge jeans. Where did you get these? An ex-sister-in-law had a boyfriend that I believe had a Levi's store. They were like promotional items that were distributed by Levi's in like the early 80s. I'm pretty sure the story goes, Levi Strauss was a tent maker. He had tons of canvas. And there was a tailor in Reno that invented these, the copper rivets. It made the pockets really strong. Because remember, these were miners sticking rocks and tools in their pockets. Say, so, OK, let's use the canvas for the tents, dye it blue, and it won't show the dirt as bad. Yeah, I haven't washed my jeans for a month. <laughs> Can't even tell. <laughs> Levi Strauss is a perfect example of achieving the American dream. He moved from Germany to the States when he was young, worked his butt off, and eventually became rich and famous. He's still the biggest name in jeans to this day. What happened here? Um, I think just from being stored for so many years. All right. I just wish it had the patch. But it's got the little Levi thing there on the pocket. Levi's is iconic, and there's collectors for it. Always has been. Collectors love vintage Levi's. These jumbo size ones might not be worth a fortune, but believe it or not, I know diehard collectors who hang stuff like this as a display piece. I'm almost certain I'll be able to sell them. All right, so um, how much you want for them? Um, I was thinking about 200. God, if they had that tag on it, I'd pull the money right out. Um, I was thinking like 100. Um, no, maybe 180. I'll give you 125. Got the red tag, Levi's. Um, 150. No negotiation. Take it or leave it. Yeah, I'll take it. All right, sweet. Right up, chum. Even though I've sold lots of vintage Levi's over the years, this is my first pair of big display Levi's. But hey, it's Vegas. You have to gamble sometimes. But unlike Corey, when I gamble, it's a controlled gamble, not a $1,500 gamble. <laughs> I do it for you. I got a bike I build. Hey, Corey, this guy has something you might want to check out. All right, man, uh, pull it around back. I got a uh, parking spot back there. Boom. You never really know what you're going to get when it comes to homemade bikes, but I got to at least take a look. Who knows? Maybe it'll actually be cool. What in the hell is this? 125. Stand up and ride. I've been working on this for about nine years. You're telling me nine years and you didn't lose interest in building this thing? <laughs>
came down to the pawn shop today to sell my Stand Up and Ride 125 scooter. I make them from the ground up. I bend all the tube, weld all the steel, everything on it except for the motor and the shocks. I need the money for some other projects I'm working on. Uh, I'm asking 21. I would probably take 18, 1850. So is this a prototype? Yeah. What made you actually want to build it? You feel like the bionic man riding it because you're standing up doing 50. It's pretty cool. You do 50 miles an hour standing up on a scooter? Yeah, the fun is standing up, you know. Yeah, I can see how kids could really get into it. I mean, literally, since the 1800s, ever since they came up with small motors, they've been trying to figure out a way to put them on bicycles. Uh, Mercedes-Benz actually made a uh, motorcycle with a steam engine on it. Uh, it wasn't real fast, and it sort of had a tendency to light the passenger on fire, but... <laughs> <laughs> It's like a law of nature. Guys love motorcycles. They've been popular in the US since the early 1900s, when Indian and Harley Davidson hit the scene. It's kickstart, obviously. There's your shifter. That's your rear brake, I'm assuming, back there? Yeah. You put your foot on there like this, kind of, and then your foot under here for shifting up, and the okay. clutch is up here, and then twist throttle, front brake. If you can ride a motorcycle, you can ride it. That's actually pretty cool. I thought I'd seen every type of motorcycle, but nothing quite like this. Let me see you drive this thing. All right, fair enough. This looks like it could be a lot of fun to ride, but it's got such a high center of gravity, I think you might go head first into some concrete. This thing is ridiculous. <laughs> That thing goes pretty fast for a scooter, man. How much are you looking to get out of it? I'd like to get about 21 for it. You have a design here that you came up with by yourself, and no offense, but if it were made by Honda, I'd love to buy it. Yeah. Go out, create a market for it, sell a 1,000 of them, bring one to me, and maybe I'll buy one. Well, I think you guys are making a mistake, but everybody has their opinion, you know? This guy wanted way too much for a homemade scooter. If I could have picked it up for a couple hundred bucks, maybe I could have sold it to someone looking for a fun time with it. Earlier, I paid 1,500 bucks for a piece of an SR-71 Blackbird that's signed by some test pilots. I kind of bought it on a guess, so now my buddy Matt's going to tell me if I made a good deal. What's going on, Matt? Not much, Corey. How you doing? Doing well, buddy. So. Guy came in and sold this to me, told me it was from an SR-71 Blackbird. Nice. The guys call me down to the shop anytime they have anything aviation or military related. I try to answer any questions they might have. So the SR-71 had its first flight in 1964. Uh, it was a leader of its time. This is probably one of the coolest aircraft ever made. It did not have any weapons on it. It basically flew high and it flew fast. Wow. <laughs> I think it went over 3.5 times the speed of sound. That's nuts. To fly the SR-71, it's almost like being an astronaut. They're flying up at 80,000 feet. You're starting to get up there near the space region, starting to see the curvature of the Earth and that. That's high. This is titanium, right? Well, let me take a look at it here. Corey, I uh, hate to break it to you, but this actually is not titanium. Ah, oh, you're kidding me. This actually looks more like a composite alloy. You can see the rivets here. Most of the leading edges were titanium, but they only needed titanium in certain spots on the aircraft. OK, but it is from an SR-71. Well, obviously, it says SR-71 on it. It's got the uh, Buno number here uh, in stencil, so that looks official. And one of the key things here, you can kind of look at the rivets and how they're spaced. Uh, that looks like it was professionally done by Lockheed. And then you've actually got some names. It looks like you got two signatures on here. The first one, Bill Flanagan, uh, SR-71 flight test. So Bill worked on the program uh, at Skunk Works. OK. Uh, Robert Gilliland, he's the first one to fly the SR-71. Of the 32 that they built, he flew every one of them. Wow. Dutch 5-1, that's his call sign. And that all makes sense. So these are the names that you want on something like this? They are. Sweet. Yeah, somebody's going to have to eat some crow over that one. Um, <laughs> So I bought it for 1500 bucks. What do you think I could sell it for? It's in good condition. It's got the stenciling. It's got two signatures of Pioneers and Aviation on there. I think you could easily get that. I think in the right scenario, you could even get more.
In this business, breaking even on an item pretty much loses us money because we have to pay a sales commission to whoever sells it. I just know my dad is gonna get on my case about this. Hey, how can I help you? I got these uh, vintage 1970s Snoopy memorabilia music boxes. You would have liked playing with these when you were a kid, wouldn't you? Where's the remote control? <laughs> <laughs> I came to Pawn Shop today to try and sell my Snoopy and Red Baron music boxes. My kids don't know who Snoopy is, so I uh, figure they're not doing any good in this box. I'd like to get maybe 150 for the pair. We'll see what they say. How old are these things? Probably early 70s. Snoopy was big right around that time. Like the Snoopy specials started coming out on television. Christmas specials and the Great Pumpkin and all yeah. that stuff. What I like about these things, you know, Snoopy was always in his little uh, imaginary world. Yeah, Snoopy used to climb on top of his doghouse and fantasize that his doghouse was a plane and he was fighting the Red Baron. Oh, you know what's always good about uh, Peanuts is adults never spoke. Yeah. Like, wah, 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 wah. That's what you sound like. <laughs> Snoopy was one of the characters drawn by Charles Schultz in the comic strip Peanuts. It ran in newspapers around the world for about 50 years. It's considered the most popular comic strip ever. People still love Peanuts, so there's definitely a great market for vintage toys like these. I mean, I love the quality of the toys they made. They're all wood. Do they uh, play music? Yes, technically. Spin the propeller here. What do we got? This one doesn't even work. You got a few problems here. The music box doesn't play and the tail's broken off. This thing in great shape is worth a few hundred bucks, but unfortunately, in that shape, it's worth nothing. How and the Red Baron here? The Red Baron. He's looking pretty good. You know what? If Snoopy was in great shape, I'd buy the Red Baron right off you. Together, they make a really great pair. But I'm not going to be able to sell the Red Baron unless I got a Snoopy to go with it. Right. And I don't have a Snoopy to go with it. I got a broken toy. It's just not good enough shape for a toy collector. Um, Can you make me an offer? I'm not even going to make you an offer because it's not going to sell with that piece broken off the back, plain and simple. All right. And if I did buy him, this guy probably would just break he it even more. play with it. <laughs> well, thanks for coming in. Well, thank you anyway. Appreciate it. I thought they were worth something, but he didn't. But I guess I'm just going to put him back in the box, and he'll sit for another 20 years, I guess. Earlier, a guy brought in a can, and he says it's from the 1500s. I'm not sure if it's authentic or not, so I asked my buddy Mark to come on down and take a closer look. Hey, Rick. Hey, Mark, how's it going? It's going well. So what have we got today? Um, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you guys normally call me down here if they have um, an historical artifact that they want a little bit more history on. Given that it's in bronze, it would have been a naval cannon. The symbol here looks to be Spanish. The Spanish had a lot of need for cannon because they were in Mexico, they were in South America. They were noted for a lot of their early cannon. Cannons in the early days were important parts of your defense and your offensive capability as a country. So what concerns do you have about the piece? Is it real? One of the things you want to look at is what is the thickness at this end? If this is very thin, this was never used. Do you have something that we can check the length of, of the bore? Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes, thank you for leaving the scabbard on. <laughs> okay, now it's up against the end. You got it? Good. Let's check the length here. This is rather thin. This gives me pause. Plus, these images are wrong. These are not uh, 16th century images. And the trunnions were always cast into the cannon. They were never applied to the cannon afterwards. And these are. What you have is a reproduction. That's, you know, obviously not what I intended when I bought it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Not a problem. All Good right. to see you again. All right. You didn't ruin all my day, just most of it. <laughs> all right. Yeah, have fun. It was made to be a decorative item, you know, sort of like having a nice picture on the wall or something like this. You can have a nice cannon in your living room. Well, you do have a pretty garden piece. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to make a deal.
All right. Well, I appreciate it. Have a nice day. You bet. You know, I've been buying and selling this stuff for a long time. I've made enormous hits, and I've had some pretty dramatic losses. I find it better just to move on. Corey, I saw you talking to Matt a while ago. What was that all about? He was giving me more information about the SR-71 panel. So what was it made out of? It wasn't made out of titanium, some other metal. So apparently you're not a metallurgist. I took a guess, whatever. You think my family would want me to succeed, but instead they only seem happy when they catch me screwing up. Is it real? Yes, it is. How much is it worth? Uh, Matt said it was worth around 1500 We broke even again, Rick, maybe. We're not going to make a home run off it, but we'll make our money back plus some. Just go to work. Whatever, oh, dude. Another one bites the dust. Lay off of him, Rick. You weren't much better at his age. <laughs>